All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Today is May 11th, 2021. I'm Steve Shields, president of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. On behalf of the officers and council, I welcome you to our lecture. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, the fourth year of the Kwangmu Emperor of Korea. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their continuing support. We also thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential primary funding for RAS Korea. Without your membership, we would not be able to host this lecture series. We would love to have you join us if you are not already a member. <clears throat> it only takes a few minutes to sign up. Membership gives you the opportunity support, to support the world's first and oldest Korean studies organization. For 120 years, 121 years now, we have strived to explore and promote all facets of Korea's rich heritage. Members receive our annual journal transactions. Members also are recognized reciprocally by most of Asia's RAS affiliated societies, as well as the London based original RAS. See our website at raskb.com for details. I will post a link in the chat box in a few minutes. If you are not a member, we request a one-time admission donation. Please refer to the donation page on your screen for PayPal and bank transfer information. This information will also be posted in the chat box. We are joined tonight by Pierre-Emmanuel Roux, an associate professor of East Asian history at the University of Paris and the co-editor of the French scholarly journal. Um, how do you say that, Pierre-Emmanuel? Uh, Extreme Orient, Extreme Occident, it's Far East, Far West. Far East, Far yeah. West, thank you. Um, I, I copied it from your bio and then forgot to learn how to say it. Uh, his current research uh, in, includes a biography of Kim Taegon and the translation of Pak Chi Wan's novels into French. Uh, he's the author of two books on East Asian encounters with the West in the 19th century. After the lecture, there will be time for questions. Please welcome Professor Ru. So, may I or please go ahead? Oh well, so uh, let me share my uh, yes, please. Uh, my screen once more. So, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, it looks good. Yes. Can you hear me clearly? We're well, coming through I do loud the and clear. connection. Loud and clear. Okay. Well, okay. Great. So, um, many thanks, uh, Steve, for this uh, introduction and uh, this invitation. Uh, I'm very excited to present my current research, that is also a book project. Um, well, actually, a number of books have been written on Kim Tae in Korean. Uh, several books have been published this year. Uh, or are about to be published in Korea. Uh, as for me, my aim is not just to write the first biography of Kim tae in English. It is also to write the first academic and non-agrographical biography of Kim tae mm -hmm. in any language. Uh, so it may be quite an unconventional presentation today, uh, but I hope we will enjoy it. But let me start with a quiz. So, uh, what is the common point between Napoleon and Kim tae in 2021? <clears throat> well, the answer is 2021 marks the bicentenary of a birth or death. Now, what is the difference between Napoleon and Kim tae in 2021? 
The difference is that France commemorates but does not celebrate the death of Napoleon. And the nuance is important. Uh, and in South Korea, well, South Korea celebrates the birth of Kim Tae-gun under the patronage of UNESCO. So that's the main difference with the two. Um, actually, it's not the first time that uh, South Korea obtained the patronage of UNESCO for celebrating a current historical figure. Uh, it was already the case in uh, 2012 for uh, the famous scholar Zhang Yagyong. Um, but well, let's come back to Kim Tae-gun. Actually, he was already the, the great hero of Catholicism prior to 2021. And perhaps the best example to illustrate this point is the Jolto Sign uh, Martyr's Shrine in Seoul. So which is here. Uh, so if we zoom, so it's uh, on the Han River. And um, so what is Jolto Sign? Uh, if you live in Seoul, you all know that. It's uh, uh, the beheading hill. Uh, so it's uh, basically the symbol of the uh, persecution of Catholicism during the Choson dynasty. And it is on this rocky promontory that Catholics were executed and their body was thrown in the Han River during the last major anti-Christian campaign in 1866 to 1871. Um, so nowadays, if you go to uh, Joltusan, you have so this shrine, and when you enter the shrine, you can see an imposing statue of Kim Tae Gong. Um, so, and if you go around the, the park, you can find another statue of Kim Tae Gong. Then the most striking point, uh, the most striking point, is the fact that Kim Tae Gong did not die at Joltusan. And he never came to this place. Um, so this paradox uh, reveals that Kim Tae-gon benefits from a very special status within the history of current Christianity. So Kim Tae-gon is not just a Catholic saint. He is probably the greatest of Korea's saint. Um, Kim Tae-gon actually died a few kilometers east from Joltusan here in Senamtho. Uh, so now, nowadays you have um, a beautiful church, the Senator Church, and if you look here, you also have a statue of uh, Kim Tae Gong, of course. Uh, and if you search on the new Bible of Internet, Wikipedia, you of course have a biography of uh, Kim Tae Gong. And if you look at the languages, you have more than 15 languages, um, well, a biography in more than 15 languages. So basically is the superstar of the current church. Uh, but well, in order to understand this importance of Kim Tegon in the history of current Catholicism, we need first to understand the situation of local converts and priests in late Chosen Korea. Uh, first, lay people played a very important role. Uh, as most of you may know, the Korean church was established by lay people in the 1780s. And in contrast, there was a very low number of priests before the 18, uh, six, uh, 80s, before the so-called opening uh, of Korea. So there were only two Chinese priests who only stayed for a few years. Then we had 32 French missionaries from the uh, Paris Friar Mission Society, the MEP, then only from the 1830s onwards. And we had only two Korean priests. And uh, the first of them, uh, Kim Tegon, was a priest for only one year. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do today is to present um, a biography of Kim Tegon in two parts. And the first part will focus on the clandestine life of uh, Kim Tegon as a go-between, not just as an ecclesiastical uh, person, um, and I would show so that uh, he was a go-between. He was never a foreign missionary nor a local convert. So it's very interesting because um, he brings a local voice uh, in Latin, uh, usually, uh, not in, in Korean, but in Latin. And it also, it's also interesting because um, he shows a circulation of knowledge and he was involved in was in what I would call religious smuggling between China and Korea. Uh, then I also try to go beyond the geography 
uh, with this trial. Uh, so beyond the spirit martyrdom, uh, beyond so uh, so so well, he was arrested. He died as a saint and a martyr and blah 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 blah. So I want to go beyond that. Uh, and well, what I my aim is to write what I may call a global current history of Kim Tegon as a Catholic man, and not the contrary, which is a religious history of a Korean man. And then my second part uh, of this talk will focus on the making of a Catholic hero. So maybe the afterlife of Kim Tegon on earth, uh, not in heaven. Um, so I will show that uh, we can uh, encompass all the current Catholic history with one man, and we can also go beyond Catholic history. Uh, so we can move from just a Catholic saint to a hero and a superstar. And I would try to show what does the life of Kim Tegon bring to our understanding of the late Chosun and modern period. Um, so first, let's start with the clandestine life of a go-between. Um, but uh, first, uh, I think we need to uh, understand when and how was Catholicism introduced in Korea. Um, so it was introduced through the apostolate through books since the early 17th century in Beijing. So we have current with uh, Catholicism translated in Chinese and also books of science can be geography, cartography, mathematics and so on. And after almost two centuries, then a Catholic, um, well, one current man, Yi Sung-hun decided to go to Beijing and be baptized so in 74. Uh, so that is the birth of the calendar. So that's uh, so it starts in 1784. Um, then the first Catholic communities were um, established in several places in Korea, but uh, so the current church was born, uh, it's important, among members of the elite, the young man, and then it developed through familial uh, social and geographical networks. And perhaps more importantly, it was it developed in very localized communities. So it first developed in Seoul and its uh, region, and then in um, the south, in uh, the uh, Chungcheon province and Chola province, but in very specific place. And what will interest us today is this second birthplace of a Korean church, a region which is called Nepo. Uh, which is not an administrative region, um, but a geographical region. So, which is here. If you uh, look at a tourist map of Korea, well, there is uh, basically nothing to do. Uh, but actually, during the Chosun period, it was not actually a, a remote, a completely remote place. To give, to provide just one example, um, I guess. Most of you know this uh, figure of Iik uh, was a Namin scholar, a very very famous Namin scholar, uh, was also one of the most famous thinkers of the 18th century, and he lived in Nepal. And uh, nowadays he has a, a museum uh, in the region, and uh, it was among uh, his disciples that the first Catholic converts and their opponents emerged in the late 18th century. So it also explained why uh, this region was the second birthplace of Catholic in Korea. And it was also the birthplace of Kim tae uh, So Kim tae was born in a small village uh, called Solmue, uh, the Pine Mountains. Um, and uh, nowadays, of course, uh, you have statues and uh, the home of Kim tae was rebuilt there. Um, and interestingly, if you look at this map, you also have on the south, the birthplace of Kim Jong-hee, who was one of the most famous uh, scholar and official of the 19th century. So once again, it shows that this region was not completely remote and it was actually uh, closely linked to Seoul uh, and it explained why so uh, Catherine could move from Seoul to this region in the late 18th century. Um, well, so 
uh, the family of Kim Tae-gon was one of the first to convert to Catholicism. And what is very interesting here is that in the Kim family, you have four generations of martyrs. So uh, Kim Jin-ho, the great-grandfather of Kim Tae-gon, died in custody, we don't know in which circumstances, in 1814. Then his, great, uh, his grandfather, uh, Kim Tae-kyun, died as a martyr. We don't know the circumstances either, but he has to be a martyr in 1830. Then his father, uh, Kim tae uh, we know for sure that he was beheaded in Seoul in 1839. And then Kim Tae-gon uh, himself was beheaded in Seoul in 1846. And last but not least, also 11 relatives of Kim Tae-gon were executed in the first half of the 19th century. So you have a family of martyrs, um, which is uh, an important point. Uh, well, now if we look at the, um, the, uh, the year of Kim Tae-gon, uh, basically we know almost nothing uh, because Catholicism was severely repressed after 1801. And Catholics did not Israel. produce much records. And we only know. Could you mute? Could you mute your mic? Thank you. So we only know that Kim's family fled to a remote place near uh, Yongin uh, in uh, 1827. Uh, and actually, most of the converts uh, in Korea fled to the eastern part of Korea and the mountains um, in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, so it was something very common. And we, then we know that uh, Kim Tegon was baptized at 815. And actually, uh, this very late baptism was uh, something very common uh, in those times uh, because, well, parents were afraid that their children would told um, the so-called pagans, not faithful, that, oh, my father has a Bible at home and a cross and something, and uh, they were afraid they could be arrested. So baptism were done quite late. It was the case for Kim Tae-gon. Um, but, well, so why did Kim Tae-gon uh, become the first Korean-born Catholic priest? Um, Actually, uh, in the late 18th century, the first convert established what uh, modern historiography calls a pseudo-ecclesiastical hierarchy. It lasted from uh, 1786 to 1790. And then they discovered that uh, they could not decide on their own who would be bishop, who would be priest. Um, so um, it came to an end in 1790. Um, and from this time onward, there were no Catholic priests until uh, the mid uh, 19th century, until Kim Tae Gong. Um, so, how can we explain that? Um, actually, uh, we can look at the social status of religious specialists uh, in the Chosun dynasty. Buddhist monks and shamans were considered at the bottom of a social hierarchy. Um, so, basically, uh, Koreans, um, well, in the early 19th century, did not want to become priests. Uh, what they wanted uh, was something else. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, so Western missionaries could only send two Chinese clandestine uh, priests, uh, first Zhou Wenmo in the late uh, 18th century, so he was executed in 1801. Uh, so now he has uh, several statues in Korea. And the second one, Liu Fangji, uh, sorry, we uh, don't have any images uh, where he's not welcome anymore in the history of Korean church. Um, he's supposed to, had, uh, to have had a concubine in Korea. So, um, well, and the MEP missionaries did not like him. So basically he's not, uh, he's not welcome anymore. So no statue, no image, nothing. Um, well, so what did, the, uh, the Korean converts want. They wanted a scientific missionary. Uh, they wanted missionaries like Matteo Ricci, like Ferdinand Verbist in China. So missionaries skilled in mathematics, astronomy, art, um, and so on. And they hoped that the missionary would come on big ships and offer um, a lot of prisons to him and they would be accepted. 
Um, on the Korean side, also a number of um, of scholars also thought that it would be not bad to have uh, missionaries uh, in Korea. Uh, a good example is Park Chae Ga. Uh, he wrote um, a memorial to the throne in 1786, and he advocated that we could uh, accept missionaries in Korea. Uh, we could put them in one house and close the house, let them do their work, and don't let them go out. Um, uh, what actually didn't work, but um, uh, the idea was here. And um, the Korean converts in the um, in the first half of the 19th century sent a number of letters to the Pope and the Bishop of Beijing requesting uh, this kind of scientific missionaries. And the problem was that in China and in Rome, uh, nobody understood that. Uh, and everybody thought we have to send clandestine missionaries in Chaucer. So basically it was the case uh, when the MEP missionaries arrived in Chaucer in the 1830s, uh, they were clandestine missionaries and they wanted to raise local clergy, so a clandestine local clergy. So it was uh, in this uh, situation, in these conditions, that uh, Kim Tegon and then others uh, became uh, priest or seminarians and then priest. Um, so Kim Tegon was chosen with two other young Koreans in uh, late 1836 to become seminarians and to study abroad uh, theology. Um, so as you can see on this map, uh, so um, uh, Kim Tegon left Seoul, uh, traveled all around China and then arrived in Macau uh, where he studied there for uh, several years and then uh, traveled a lot in North China and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, here you have a painting of, well, uh, everything Kim tae did has been painted in the late uh, 20th century. So uh, so you have him, you have him crossing the, the Sinochrome border, then you have Kim tae on the Great Wall, uh, you don't see his camera but uh, well, um, well, it's like a, a tourist picture here. Um, but then, well, he arrived then in, um, in Macau uh, to study there in the so-called Korean seminary. Uh, well, uh, the, the current term, but nowadays current term is Chosun uh, Shinakyo. But actually there was no seminary. Uh, the map uh, had no seminary in, in Macau. Um, there was only a room in the procuration house um, of MEP in Macau. And uh, well, it was there that he studied for four years. Uh, but what we can say is that Kim Tegon was actually um, a kind of homeless seminary uh, because it was not a seminary. Um, it was taught by several uh, French priests um, who uh, came to the procuration house before going to the mission field. Um, so it was not a very good training. Uh, and basically there was nowhere else to go. Uh, so it was taught there. Um, and then from 1842 onwards, uh, Kim Tegon uh, traveled uh, in North China, then from Nanjing to uh, Pai Jia Tian, uh, and then to the Sino-Korean border at Uju. He went there several times. Uh, he also spent uh, more than two years in a place called Siopadiaz. And he also went to the northeast border to open a new uh, route to sneak into Korea. Um, so basically, my, uh, my point here is that uh, Kim tae was not just a seminarian. He was a go-between. Uh, he was a translator and interpreter, he was a cartographer, he was an agiographer, and finally, he was a priest. Uh, so, uh, as for translator and interpreter, um, Kim tae spent a month uh, with French naval officers and even attended the Nanjing Treaty at the end of the First Opium War between uh, Britain and China. So he was the, the only Korean uh, national who attended uh, this, uh, uh, this treaty. 
and um, he mastered uh, several languages, of course, Korean mother tongue. Uh, he also learned Chinese, was fluent in, uh, in Chinese, uh, probably also uh, he understood quite well classical Chinese. Uh, Latin also, he wrote uh, all his letters in Latin and he also understood French, uh, was able to, sp to spoke French, uh, perhaps well, he was a uh, master Latin better than French, but he was able to understand French. Um, but one of his main activity was to encounter current converts um, on the sino korean border between eight, uh, 1842 and 1844. Um, here we have to stress the specificity of a sino korean border during the Choson dynasty. Uh, actually, there was not a borderline between Korea and China. There was a kind of borderland uh, and with uh, a no man's land uh, between um, Korea and China. And um, there was a kind of Catholic myth of an impenetrable border. Uh, and you have um, this myth until nowadays um, among current Catholics. Uh, it was impossible to cross the border. Actually, it was possible to cross the border and there was a number of smuggling activities beginning with uh, smuggling of uh, ginseng. And um, as a result of that, um, well, my idea is that uh, current uh, that Kim tae uh, became a kind of religious smuggler of broker um, because his task was to introduce French missionaries and to act as a go between between a go between between China and, and Korea. Um, uh, then um, I think probably his most important contribution. Um, was um, to draw a map uh, for the missionaries. Uh, the supposed original was uh, rediscovered in uh, 2019 in the, uh, libra the National Library of France. So it is supposed to be the original, uh, even for I do have some doubts, but um, what we know for sure is that there are two copies of this map uh, at uh, the uh, National Library of France with a major era. There is no borderline between the Chungcheong province and the Kyongsang province. Um, note that um, one of the copies was first rediscovered in, 17, uh, in 1978 and the others were uh, rediscovered very late. Uh, actually, uh, very recently, three other copies, uh, expanded copies, were rediscovered. Uh, two were discovered in 2020, uh, one uh, so in the National Library of France and one in the US National Archives, and also another in the MAP Library. And you know, these three expanded copies uh, were produced in the um, 1860s. And some of them were used by uh, the Rear Admiral Rose when um, he led his expedition against Korea in 1866. Uh, so this map was quite important, uh, even though it was uh, criticized, uh, for example, in France by um, a number of cartographers in the 19th century. Um, so basically it was the best map available for um, Westerners in the uh, mid 19th century. So I think this point is also important. And if we compare this map with uh, the best map ever produced in the Choson dynasty, by uh, Kim Jong Ho. Um, so, uh, well, we can see that this map, well, was not as good as Kim Jong Ho, but it was not, not that bad. Um, another task of Kim Tae was to be an agographer to describe um, what had occurred during a previous uh, persecution. And, well, finally, uh, finally, he became a priest. Uh, in 1845. So, um, well, what I say is was hastily ordained in, in Shanghai uh, because, well, when you read the letters, well, you understand that it was not completely ready. But, well, anyway, you, well, two French missionaries actually wanted to go to Korea in 1845 and they needed Kim Tegon to be ordained a priest before that. 
So it was ordained a priest and they went, they went to Korea. Um, uh, well, yeah. So, oh, my map there is in Korean, but anyway, uh, anyway. So, um, if first they first arrived in Jeju uh, with two French missionaries, so the, the Bishop Ferreol and a priest, Dava Louis, who would become also a bishop afterwards and a martyr in 1866. Um, so, basically, you understand that even as a priest, uh, Kim Tae Gun was a worker for French missionaries. Um, then, uh, so they arrived, so the three um, arrived in Korea, and in that time, well, uh, in East Asia and in Korea, uh, there was an itinerant clergy. So it was one of the main characteristics of Catholic mission in East Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, usually priests did not stay one place, they had to move to a number of places uh, for their pastoral works. And as for Kim Tegon, well, he did a few mass, and interestingly, he only stayed uh, in one place, and so he had a very short administration of the faithful, because actually, uh, he received a new task from his bishop, was to find the best place in the Yellow Sea, to uh, well, to find the best contact point uh, for the next French missionaries who would arrive uh, in Korea uh, on Chinese junk. Uh, so where would be the most uh, safest place? And it is in this context that uh, Kim Tegon was arrested uh, in nowadays Hwanghae province, uh, no, so North Korea. And so, uh, so began the trial of Kim Tegon, uh, which led to his uh, execution. So usually this uh, trial um, is uh, depicted as um, a contribution of Kim Tegon to the establishment of the Catholic Church in Korea. So he ended as a martyr. And, and so his case is really presented very, uh, very simply. So, um, so are you a Catholic? Yes. So when you can die. Um, actually, it was much more complicated than that. Um, his uh, judgment, his trial, duly followed the general scheme and procedure of criminal cases. So his case was first tried at the local level uh, and then re-examined at successive administrative levels, starting with the province and continuing upward to the central government. And what is very interesting here is that you have different stories on the Korean side and the uh, Western side. Uh, when, if you look at Korean government sources, um, Kim Tae-gon is a Chinese national. He also has a Chinese name, which is not Kim Tae-gon, uh, and he is someone who wants to visit the Chosun. Um, and he practices the Western teaching, Yang Yo, which is not Catholicism. Uh, then, uh, it says that uh, he practices the luminous teaching, which was actually uh, Kyongyu, which has actually the name for Nestorianism, uh, which is not Catholicism. And then in some texts you find that, well, he practiced uh, the learning of the Lord of Even, which was the name for Catholicism. And it was only very late that it was discovered that he was a current Catholic priest. Uh, so you have different stories on the current side. And when you look at French and Latin sources, uh, then you have a totally different story. So he is a Catholic, a current Catholic. It was not a Chinese, but he grew up in China. Uh, and hearings were held with the help of the interpreter. And uh, Kim Tae-gun refused to apostatize. And he had to translate in Korean um, an English map of the world. Um, so, well, you have a lot of different details, um, uh, but the common point is that uh, at the end of his trial, uh, there was no verdict, uh, contrary to one could expect, and uh, Kim Tegon spent three months in prison, and the situation only changed when a French rear admiral uh, named Cecile arrived in Korea in August 1846, um, so he... 
uh, send, a, send a letter to the to the current government and he asked why did you execute uh, or why did you kill uh, three French missionaries in 1839 you had no right to do that blah 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 and I will come back next year uh, to get you answer um, well usually uh, scholars um, say that uh, after that Kim Tegon was executed but strangely enough well it lasted one more month before his execution uh, so the government fought and fought and fought and fought and fought and it was only in mid uh, September 1846 that he was finally executed uh, for the crime of high treason and as a trespasser who crossed the border as a Catholic. So a trespasser came comes before a Catholic. Uh, so that's important. So and he was sentenced to uh, decapitation. Um, and uh, what is important here, I think, if we want to understand his execution, uh, is uh, several points. Uh, first, we have to understand the government attitude toward Catholicism. Actually, Catholics were rarely sentenced to death, except during these wide-scale anti-Christian campaigns. Um, so it explains it can explain why it lasted so long uh, for Kim Tegon to be executed. Another point is the complexity of a chosen legal system. Uh, death penalty cases required a number of separate review hearings, and unresolved cases review, were reviewed again after a lapse of several months or several years. And if uh, the French rear admiral had not come to Korea. Uh, we can suppose that uh, his trial would have um, been even longer. Uh, then a last point is the border issue. Um, the border issue was um, a central issue in the uh, mid 19th century uh, for Korea. Um, and especially at a time when uh, Western uh, ships, Western vessels arrive on the Korean shores. Um, so, as a conclusion, uh, when you look at the, uh, the trials, of, um, especially the Korean side, um, and the Korean sources, you, uh, you understand that Kim tae was executed more as a traitor than as a Catholic heretic. Uh, I think this point is very important. Well, uh, if you're a good Catholic, well, you can think that he died as um, a Catholic, so he's a martyr, and well, it's and uh, and the end. But well, if you look at current sources, then the situation is different uh, because uh, well, the current government did not uh, look at his letters written in, in in Korean. Well, what is important here is what the government decides uh, with uh, his own judgment. Uh, well, so uh, now Kim. Not totally. Uh, so, going to enter the, the second part of my talk. I, I think I'm, I've been talking for 33 minutes. I will try to uh, in minutes. So, if questions, uh, Steve, if I speak too much, uh, you please <laughs> no, don't hesitate to tell me. No problem. Keep going. You're doing great. Thank you. Okay. So, now we're entering the afterlife of Kim Tae Gong. Uh, he stays on Earth. And uh, now we'll uh, see uh, the making of a Catholic hero. So, um, how did Kim tae become the greatest hero of current Catholicism? Good question. So, here we have to divide uh, Catholics and non-Catholics. So, uh, for Catholics, is a saint, is the most venerated saint of current Catholicism. And nowadays, for uh, Non-Catholic, just a kind of cultural icon. Um, uh, so my idea is that Kim Tae Gon is a Catholic hero, not just a saint, a Catholic kind of Catholic hero. Um, but to start with, uh, I had first to remind you of the, canon the canonization process for sainthood in Catholicism. So how you become a, a saint? First, you have to become a virgin, so you are a in virtue. Then you are a blessed person beatified, and then you become a saint. Uh, that's the uh, canonization. 
As for um, Kim Tegon, so he was declared venerable in 1857. Then he was beatified in 1925. Then he was canonized, so he became a saint in 1884. And in the meanwhile, uh, in, 18, in 1949, sorry, he became the patron saint of current clergy. And on this uh, painting you have on this slide, a uh, painting was made for the canonization of the uh, 103 martyrs in 1984. Uh, Kim Tegon um, is the most important person. You have uh, French missionaries on his uh, side uh, and Koreans on the other side, but is in the center. Um, so is the keepers. Um, now, if you uh, look at the current clergy in the 19th century, as I told the, of this talk, there were only two priests in the 19th century. Uh, so Kim Tegon and the other was Thomas Cheyangop, so uh, he was active in the uh, 1850s. And uh, so this uh, Thomas Cheyangop, uh, actually, uh, he's in his bed. So he's not a martyr, uh, but well, now, well, a few years ago, um, the Korean church, uh, well, wanted to have him recognized as an important figure. So he was declared venerable in 2016. Um, so now he has his own statues. Um, his home in Chungcheong province was rebuilt. He has also uh, on, the, um, on the bottom, a museum, uh, uh, nearby, which was established in uh, 2014. And there is also uh, a drama on, uh, on him. And what is interesting here is that uh, you have here, so he's the Taktok Cheyang Hop, so the priest uh, Cheyang Hop, and you know, he's Tame Sung Yoja. So he's the martyr of sweat. So basically, you know, in Korea, even if you're not a martyr, you have to die as a martyr. So he's a martyr of sweat because you work very hard. You're always a martyr in Korea. Anyway, um, then another important point here is the question of Korean historiography in the, 19th, in the 20th century. Um, I think you have several key points, but here we will only keep two, uh, two key points. The first one is glorification. Um, so Korea has a glorious past. Well, if you read a Korean textbook, and so Korea has a glorious past. But also Korea is a victim. Um, you all know that. Uh, Korea has long been a victim or was always a victim, a victim of China, it was a tributary state of China, a victim of Japan because it was a colony of Japan. And now Korea is a victim of a, of a Cold War. And for Catholics, well, Catholics were victims who obtained glory through martyrdom. So, I mean, it works quite well um, for the making of heroes. Now, if you look at the making of heroes in modern Korea, um, I only give three examples here, but um, we can also use other examples. But perhaps the best known example, King Sejong, the admiral uh, who invented um, the uh, current script, uh, Hangul, and Miao Lee Shin will fought against uh, the Japanese during the Imjin War, and the famous scholar uh, Zhang Yagyong uh, that I already mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Um, so, what is the common point between these three heroes? Well, they all became Korean heroes during the 20th century. They were not heroes before that. And it was also the case for Kim Tegon. Kim Tegon was not a hero before the 20th century. Um, so how do you become a hero when you are Kim Tae Gong? Well, um, recently a scholar um, showed that Kim Tae Gong was probably a youngin, uh, that is a commoner during his life, but then he became a young man. Uh, well, uh, well, in the early 20th century, um, well, the Kim family made him a young man. So it was, um, something very common with uh, uh, false genealogies. So it is something which probably happened also for Kim Tegon. <clears throat> there were also theater plays in Catholic seminaries uh, about uh, Kim Tegon, so about Kim's youth, about uh, Kim in the tribunal. 
Uh, so it was played, for example, in Seoul, in Yongsan, and um, in other places. Uh, um, also interesting is that a supposed map, uh, the so-called English map uh, of his trial, was uh, rediscovered in the 1920s. Uh, and is now in the current Christian History Museum, the Sungshil uh, Dehakkyo Kidoku Um Well, my guess is that it's a fake one. Uh, actually, in the um, 1920s, because of the beatification, a number of fake artifacts were uh, produced uh, to make money. And my, oh, well, I think that this map is just uh, something a map drawn in the 1920s just to make money and if you compare it well it was very close to the uh, the so-called chanhado the world map produced in 18th century korea uh, and it doesn't look like a map that uh, kim Tegon was well aware of western cartography would have drawn uh, for his judges um now, um, if you look at uh, Korean uh, Catholic books in the first half of the 20th century, uh, Kittagon is already uh, an important figure. Uh, so you have his paintings, and for example, in this uh, book with the Chonjugyo uh, Kongohe Yaksa, so a brief uh, history of Catholicism, was written in uh, 1930 or 1931, I don't remember anyway. Um, he has uh, Kim Tegon as a few pages and is very uh, uh, precisely described, um, even more than other Catholics and even more than uh, foreign missionaries. Um, but on the contrary, if you look at non Catholic and non Christian publications, then you notice that remained totally unknown until the mid 20th century. Uh, it started to appear in non-Catholic publications in the 1960s, uh, as far as I know. And um, if you look at the text of Korean Korea, you see that it is also in the 1960s that the number of Catholics began to grow. Uh, uh, so basically you see that until the the, uh, the mid 20th century, uh, Catherine was uh, in, Korea, in, in Korea, and it only started in the 1960s. Um, so, uh, the reason for that? Um, the reason, perhaps, the reason is the uh, internalization of the church with the Second Vatican Council in uh, 1862, uh, uh, because at this moment, the local hierarchy was now predominantly Korean, and now worship service were held in Korean and not in Latin anymore. And at the same period, also, there was a struggle for democracy with a lot of Christians involved. Uh, we know that a number of Protestants were involved in that, but on the Catholic side, too, someone with like uh, Kim Dae-jung, so the uh, president of uh, South Korea, um, was. Uh, an activist for democracy in this time of dictature. And then it resulted, uh, well, in uh, 1984, in the canonization of this uh, uh, artist um, with, uh, you know, millions of people uh, in Seoul I was celebrating that. Uh, here you have this person next to the Pope um, uh, is, this person is uh, Stephen Kim Soo Hwan. Um, and interestingly, he became Archbishop of Seoul in 1968. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but he, perhaps he was the first non-Westerner to be the Archbishop of Seoul. And interestingly, he was the first Korean Cardinal uh, in 1969. Um, so it's not a coincidence if Kim Tegon started to be known outside of Catholic circles at the time. Um, it's probably linked with uh, Kim Soo Hwan. Um, so uh, uh, before his death. 
Um, and during the, uh, the canonization, also the, the Bank of Korea, uh, the Hangul Hang, uh, so uh, had some uh, new coins made with uh, uh, the Korean church. And uh, you see on this uh, coin of Manon of 10,001, you have Kim Taegon at the middle. Uh, of course, you have a missionary uh, and uh, a virgin on each side, but you have Kim Taegon in the middle. Um, so uh, to continue with uh, this explanation of the growth of the Catholic Church, uh, there was also a cultural policy of uh, the South Korean government, which started in the 1960s, uh, which was um, with the aim to make heroes, to make a glorious past, as I already said, and to develop a cultural heritage. Uh, it was in this context that this statue of Kim Taegon I showed you at the beginning of this talk was established in uh, 1973 um, with um, uh, the money of the current government. Uh, it was not the uh, money of the current church, but the money of the current government. Um, and also, almost at the same time, um, a number of uh, Catholic places became cultural assets, Munhaje. Uh, and the first one was uh, the um, the Cathedral of Seoul in Myeongdong uh, in 1977. Uh, so you see that Catholicism started to participate in this cultural policy of, of the current government. And now a lot of these places are, uh, well, cultural assets are linked to Kim Tae-gong. Um, then another point which is all linked with the policy of the government is the uh, growing number of holy places with the name Songji in Korea, of course, in South Korea. Um, nowadays, you have holy places linked to Korean heroes like Admiral Lee Sun Shin, like a uh, heroes of the independence movement. But you have also uh, holy places for Catholicism, for Buddhism, for Confucianism, for Protestantism, even for shamanism. Now we only look at the um, holy places for Catholicism. Uh, you have um, more than 200 um, holy places, uh, Catholic holy places nowadays. And um, most of the places are established um, thanks to the uh, current church, but well, there is always a um, well, discussion with um, the um, current uh, tourist organization and the current government before uh, the making of new uh, uh, Songji nowadays. Um, so if we start with um, the birthplace of Kim Taegon here, when you arrive there, you have, um, I took the picture, you have a Pope Francis Road, uh, and you arrive there at the, uh, you're, you're welcome at the, at Solme. Um, so you have Kim Taegon with the Pope. Um, so you have the entrance. Um, so the birthplace of Kim Taegon was rebuilt, and now you even have a statue of Pope Francis here uh, since uh, 2014. Um, then when you go to uh, Yongin, where um, uh, Kim Taegon grew up before his departure to, to China, so you have also statues of Kim Taegon. Uh, if you go now to Macau, you have um, in the church uh, where um, you used to go, uh, you have statues of Kim Taegon, even with uh, some goodies you can buy at the, um, at the entrance of a church. Uh, you have also a statue of Kim Taegon. And uh, I uh, have forgot to put a photo, but um, the procuration house where I studied, it was just behind the church in a place where now you have a McDonald's. Um, well, uh, so then, uh, even in the Philippines, where um, uh, Kim Taegon stayed a few months in 1839 because of the op first opium war, and now you have a Saint Andrew Kim Taegon shrine uh, uh, with a number of statues inside. Then, if you go to North China uh, in Siapa Diaza, you have a church uh, with a statue of Kim Taegon. You even have a Kim Taegon Road. Then if you go to Shanghai, you have um, 
the church where uh, it was ordained priest now is destroyed, but and, uh, you have a chapel of Kim Tegon with statue of Kim Tegon. And the original church in Shanghai was destroyed 20 years ago. And it was recently rebuilt uh, in Yongin um, a few years ago. Um, so that uh, nothing is lost. Uh, um, then in Jeju, when the first place where Kim arrived uh, in Korea in 1845, so now you have a Kim Tegon Memorial um, with um, a replica of a boat uh, Kim Tegon used from Shanghai to, to Jeju. So you have a picture, so you have the, uh, me on the picture shadow. And then the first place uh, in the peninsula where Kim arrived in Nabawi. So now you have a church with um, several statues of Kim Tegon. Uh, then uh, if you go to the place where Kim Tegon was arrested, then it's now nowadays in North Korea. So the solution was to erect a statue in uh, a nearby island on the southern side. Uh, so you have statues here. And then in Seoul, so you have plenty of statues here. Uh, well, uh, and then in Mirine, the first place where Kim Tegon was buried, so now you have a kind of shrine um, with statues. Uh, now you also have a holy place where not linked with uh, Kim Tae um, in the southeast of Korea. You also have schools, uh, Kim Tae schools, uh, for example, in Nonsan. Uh, you have a number of paintings of Kim Tae since the uh, early 20th century, um, all kinds of paintings. Uh, Kim Tae was on screens. There's a drama which is not that good, but well, uh, um, so he suffered a lot, as you can see, well, I, at least on screen. Um, and interestingly, uh, a number of Korean church uh, in the world, outside of Korea, have been named after Korean saints, and especially after Kim tae -gon. If you look at the situation of the United States, you see that more than half of the church are named after Kim Tae Gon. And you only have one church named after a French missionary. Yeah. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, I'm uh, almost done. Uh, so Kim Tae Gon finally became the superstar, not just the hero, but the superstar in uh, 2021 uh, when, uh, Kim, when uh, UNESCO uh, uh, gave his patronage for the commemoration of the, uh, the bicentenary of his birth. Uh, so you have now a number of um, events in Korea. Uh, well, I cannot attend because, well, uh, now uh, uh, West, well, in Europe, we cannot go to Korea, unfortunately, but I uh, watch every day on online. Um, and well, you also can buy goodies on uh, uh, kimdegon.com. Uh, so you can buy a um, coloring book. And but my uh, favorite would be the Kim Tae Gon coffee. I haven't tried yet, but still, if you can send me some coffee, I would appreciate. Um, well, so now, um, well, my conclusion, because really 50, more than 50 minutes. Um, so basically, what we can say about Kim Tae Gon is that um, he is usually remembered as the as first the Korean born. Yeah, so, uh, so Kim tae is usually remembered as the first Korean-born Catholic priest and the glorious martyrs. Um, but, well, so Kim tae has a quite unusual fate for a Korean man of a chosen period. It's because very few people had the opportunity to live abroad for such a long period of time, for almost a decade. Um, castaways could stay abroad for several years, but usually not 10 years. And even fewer were those people who dared risking their lives as religious specialists of a private doctrine. So in this sense, Kim Tae Gon spent his life as a clandestine go-between and a religious smuggler. Um, and uh, so his a particular fate explains why he came to be venerated in the 20th century and in the 21st century as the patron saint of the current clergy and the greatest hero of current Catholicism. In a certain sense, uh, Kim unwillingly became the symbol of the indonization and the success of the current church. In other words, we can say that 
uh, Kim Tae-gun is more celebrated for what he represents than for what he actually did. Uh, and I think it's not exaggerated to say that his posthumous destiny encapsulates the world history of current Catholicism and explain why Kim Tae-gun finally became more a cultural icon than just a, a Catholic saint in current history. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very, yeah. very fast paced, but uh, yeah. a, a very interesting overview. Um, it's, uh, we've got time for questions. Uh, if you want to use the raise hand function on Zoom or just type a question in the chat box, we'll try and make sure everybody gets a chance. Uh, so we can uh, the, uh, the guy read. I, I had written a question earlier, what MEP meant. Uh, and oh, one, one of our listeners uh, uh, was, was able to get the answer back to me. Uh, but I knew okay, it as okay, a okay. member of your I, I put back in a slide. <laughs> I, yeah. I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying to, I'm yeah, yeah. trying I, to. I, I, I put that. Yeah. 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 All right. Who has questions? Uh, okay. SB. SB. Ask your question, please. Uh, hi, it's Sebastian Berger here. Um, um, thank you for a really interesting talk, uh, a, re a really well structured narrative, very, a very interesting exposition. I was particularly interested in your two conflicting accounts of the trial, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Korean government one and, and the Western one. Yeah. And um, in particular, the idea that, that there was no apostatization, that he, that he declared himself a Catholic all along, uh, at being the Western account. It's very hard to square that with your description of the Korean government account, where it's not clear what he's saying at any, at any point until uh, you get right to the end. So I'm wondering, yeah. wh which of those, according to your research, which of those accounts do you see as being more credible? And do you see the Western account as a kind of basically propaganda? Because I can see, I can see a motivation for the Western account. I struggle to see why the Korean account would be so confused. Mm. Uh, um, well, uh, actually, for the um, uh, the the, um, the Western side, actually, the, uh, Kim Tae-gun wrote two letters uh, when in custody, and the first letter was actually is lost. It has been translated into French by uh, Bishop uh, uh, Ferriol, uh, who came to Korea with him. And so we don't know if his translation is accurate or not. Um, maybe to some point it is, but actually uh, the thing is that Kim Tegon, when he wrote all his letters, he said, well, I have plenty of things to say, but I don't have time and I can't write everything. So basically here it's the same, well, um, so he wanted to say a lot about his trial, but he could not say everything. And perhaps Feral changed some details, it's possible. Um, then on the Korean side, um, I think it's not, well, it was not unusual to have a different story, a slightly different story from the beginning to the end. Uh, it could change a little a little after torture, well, you can have a different version <laughs> of what you said. Um, and you have the same problem in, um, in China when you have uh, trial records on the local level and when you arrive at the capital, you sometimes have different versions. So it's not, well, well, I think the more, the more credible version is something in between the current side and the Western side. Uh, both are, uh, well, have a truth and errors, and the answer is in between. Uh, but I think what is more important here is perhaps what the government thought, I mean, what they reported when, when Kim Tae-gun was arrested on the local level, what the government said, well, he's a Chinese, he wants to visit Chosun, and he believes in the, with this strange thing. Well, uh, so you were sent to the uh, provincial capital. Then provincial capital, oh, is a Chinese guy. And uh, 
but may, maybe well uh, maybe the the judge thought he was a Korean but they wrote he was a Chinese guy um, so I think the um, the key point is not what is the truth but what they wanted to believe mm. uh, perhaps uh, this point is more important than the real truth and uh, for one point uh, which is uh, the, the terms, uh, so there was the, the Western, uh, the Western religion, Western teaching. Uh, it was uh, not used not uh, in Korea in China before the mid uh, 19th century, and it came to be used um, uh, at the time of the first Opium War, and uh, it was mainly used by anti-Catholics. So maybe it was not used by. Uh, Kim Tegum himself, I don't know, but as for the luminous teaching Nestorianism, it's very interesting because if you compare it with uh, the trial records <laughs> of 1849, you know, the, the great Nestorianist campaign, you see that the father of Kim Tegon uh, was beheaded at that time. In his trial records, he also mentioned, he was not a Catholic, he mentioned, I'm an Nestorian. And if you look also at the trial records of the first three uh, French missionaries who were executed in 1839, they also say at the beginning, we are Nestorian. They don't say we are Catholics. And it was kind of a trick, a trick which was uh, invented by the, um, the Jesuits in the 17th century in China because they rediscovered Nestorianism and they started to say that, oh, well, Nestorianism, well, is Catholicism, and still Catholicism existed in China for more than a thousand years. Uh, even though nobody understood what was Nestorianism. So basically, it was the same thing here. Uh, the Cohen judges did not know what was Nestorianism. So uh, I'm quite sure that Kim Tegon said he was a Nestorian uh, at that time. Uh, but it was at one precise moment, because we know that even if we compare the uh, Western sources and current sources, that he did not mention that he was a priest. It was at the end when you okay, I'm a priest. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, but well, it lasted more than a month be before he said that. Well, you know, he was uh, Kim Tegon was. Um, trained by uh, the MEP missionaries were used to rely on tricks. Uh, they used to find ways to say the truth, but not exactly the truth when they were arrested. Uh, for example, oh, I come from far away. Uh, I'm not a Western, I just come from far away. Uh, are you a Catholic? Oh, I'm a believer of something. Uh, no, always. Uh, uh, trials is always a uh, history of tricks uh, by um, missionaries. And I guess that Kim Tegon did the same, uh, even though he does not mention everything uh, in, his uh, in his letters. So the, well, well okay. Uh, I wanna call everyone's attention to a, a comment in the chat box uh, from Jose Antonio uh, mm -hmm. He's from the Philippines, always interested in the rise of Catholicism in Korea because such themes normally appear these days on K-drama. That got me interested. Your lecture gave me a deeper insight. More so, it is interesting to know that he stayed here in the Philippines for a while. I'd been hearing a lot about his shrine in Lo Lolomboy, uh, but mm -hmm. I've not visited yet. There are many Koreans, aside from Filipinos, who visit that shrine. So thank you for that comment and participating. I'm going to call on Brother Anthony uh, next. For a hello. Yeah, hello. We are, Hi. <laughs> we are Manuel and I, we are, we are friends. Um, yeah. I'm translating the letters of Kim, uh, Kim Degon now into English. And of course, all but of, I mean, they were all written in Latin. And one question I have is, why did the French priests, the authorities of the Met, uh, say he should not learn French? Yeah. That seems to have come down. The yeah. other question is, the last letter, the only letter 
uh, which is written in Hangul and not addressed to a French missionary, but to the Korean Christians. How do you see that last letter? So yes. two questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first question, um, yes, when I, I, I came to that letter, I was very struck that the, um, the French missionaries in 1842 do not want him to learn French anymore. Um, because he seemed that it was quite good in French. Um, and I'm still uh, struggling with that. Um, I want to check with other letters in the MEP archives now in Paris. The problem is that the archives are now open one day a week and with <laughs> only two uh, a load inside. So basically I only can go once a month and I had no time to check that. <clears throat> um, but the point, oh, well, um, one of the possibilities um, is that, um, well, um, it may have been decided by uh, Father Mest, who was his teacher in 1842. It may also have been decided in Paris, but I don't know yet where it was decided. Um, a possible explanation is that um, actually um, the, um, the French missionaries did not want him to know too much about the West. Uh, it was also the case for other East Asian seminarians. <clears throat> they were all put in, uh, in a place and they usually they did not go out. Um, so it was probably not to have access to French sources, to the possibility. Um, another possibility is that uh, they only wanted him to master Latin and to better master Latin because he was, uh, he was not uh, very good in Latin in 1842. Uh, so perhaps it was for this reason, uh, his first letters are not very good. And in eight, when you read the letters in 1845, not, not his own letters, but letters written by French missionaries about him, um, one missionary said, oh, is it Kim Taekwon who wrote these letters? There are very few mistakes. And um, because they were so used to see so many errors in his letters, then perhaps it's the question of, well, you only have to learn one language. And uh, uh, so perhaps it's that. But I have still have to struggle with that uh, in the couple of months, in the next couple of months, uh, if the archives reopen uh, every day. Yeah. Uh, as for your last letter, uh, your last question, uh, your second question and your last letter. Um, well, um, so this last letter is the uh, only letter I have not paid much attention um, uh, so far. Um, well, we only have a very late copy, uh, so from the 1880s. So, well, more, maybe it's not a, a, a real letter. Maybe it's a real letter from uh, Kim Taegon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but well, mm, so, well, I did, we're not know if it's a script of uh, him or not, but well, well, <laughs> what do you want to know? know? What do you want to know? About uh, yeah, I just, it's, I'm just curious about it because it's so different in every way. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you wonder, yeah. you wonder. Yeah, I'm also wondering. Uh, part, well, you, part, of the, uh, part of the hagiography, of course, because in Korea, that's the yeah, one. Yeah, because it was in the 1880s when it was copied that um, Western missionaries uh, made some, um, uh, uh, what do you say? Um, um, uh, what did they do? Um, they met a number of uh, old Koreans who were alive when uh, Kim Taegon died, and uh, they made interviews of this Korean, of the old Koreans. Uh, so, uh, what do you remember of Kim Taegon? And so on, and so on, and so on. And it's at the time that this letter was copied. So, um, 
maybe it has to do, yes, with the agrography, uh, because the process of uh, beatification started uh, roughly at that, in this period. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna, gonna go to uh, Jin Hyang Sol. Please uh, unmute and ask your question. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Jin Hyang Sol, um, research fellow at Seoul National University. I'm a friend of up oh, yeah. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Uh, okay. I, I have two comments and two questions. Uh, the comments is that well, one is about uh, Kim Daegon's Korean, <laughs> Korean skill. Mm. Um, I, 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 I am suspicious he was good at Korean because um, when we uh, actually, I read his, uh, I, I read his. Uh, um, letters in Latin. Actually, I, I do not read Latin, but I I, uh, I checked the, all the pronunciations he put in put in the in in the you know letters. I found that uh, he how can I say his pronoun he his way of um, uh, write down write down the pronunciation was quite not accurate mm. comparing to Korean. Uh, and one second thing is that uh, he was he was not a good at Korean history as well. If you compare with the uh, Bishop uh, W Bishop's uh, report, W mm -hmm. Bishop was really really good at Korean history and very accurate. But uh, mm -hmm. Kim Dagon's Kim Dagon's Korean history uh, showed actually he wrote a very short history short uh, Korean Catholic history in his letter, and he was not not accurate at all, at all. So I am very curious about the Kim. I, I was suspicious that Kim Dae-gun's Korean was good or not. And Kim Dae-gun's Hanmun is not, not Chinese Chinese, but Korean Chinese was good. And my second uh, comment is about the map, the Kim Dae-gun draw. Actually his, uh, his uh, map is quite similar to the maps uh, produced in Korea in late late 18th century to early 19th century. If if you compare with the the um, Jin Hyang, the, excuse me. Let okay. me interrupt and let's have Pierre handle the first question. Okay. And then let's go to your second okay, talk. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. That that way, he, we don't all have to remember so much. Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay. Just be patient. So. Pierre, answer the okay. first part, and then I'll go back to her for the second yeah. part okay. on the maps. Okay. okay. Yeah. So for the uh, language skills, um, well, uh, Kim Tae-gon actually left Korea at age 15. Yes. So basically was not very good in Korean when he left Korea. Um, and um, uh, so in Latin too, I guess he was not that good, but the problem, was perhaps his teachers. Uh, you know, French people in the 19th century were not very good in Latin too. Mm -hmm. uh, their Latin was ecclesiastical Latin. And basically it's almost like French. So basically I don't need, well, I'm not a very, well, I learned Latin at school, but I'm not very good in Latin, but mostly I don't need a dictionary when I read Latin written by French missionaries. Um, so basically, his Latin could not be as good uh, or better than French missionaries. Mm -hmm. um, so it's ex you can explain why it was not quite good in Latin. Um, and perhaps the question of the pronunciation, perhaps is, it also has to do with uh, the fact that Kim Tegon lived in the 19th century and not nowadays. Perhaps the pronunciation is different. Oh, yeah. uh, perhaps also uh, the place where he grew up Perhaps the pronunciation was a little bit different. Perhaps uh, uh, I don't know if you have you have checked that point or not. Um, so it's a question for you, Jinyoung. Um, and for the question of Korean history, uh, well, uh, of course Kim Tegon was not as good as W. Uh, well, W. He, he lived twenty years in Korea, mm -hmm. uh, so he had plenty of times to write um, his uh, history of Korea. Uh, which is not that good too, but uh, uh, the problem for uh, Kim Tegon. Uh, so he wrote um, 
uh, history of, of Korea. He also wrote a history of Manchuria in 1844. Um, and in the case of Korean history, he wrote that uh, history in 1845 when he was back in Korea between January and April 1845. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, when you read his letters, he mm -hmm. said, well, I arrived in Korea on uh, January 15th, and basically I was sick for two or three months. So basically I could not uh, do everything I wanted. So basically he wrote that in a hurry. Um, and uh, so it explains why it's um, not very good. Uh, if he was, so he was sick, he had a high disease uh, mm -hmm. and he still managed to write 100 pages. Uh, and he drew his map during this time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it explained quite well why it's not that good. Uh, Okay. But it's okay. interesting to understand what he thought about Korean history uh, mm -hmm. and about uh, because I mean what he wrote was was not it was thought uh, he thought about Korean history. He said what the authors told him what was Korean history mm -hmm. because he knew, he knew nothing. Uh, uh, he left Korea at age fifteen. What, what do you know about history? Uh, uh. Yeah. So that's yeah. the point. Now, for your question about map, well, I, I, I guess what, let, yeah. let me, let's have Jin Hyung uh, explain her question first. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I add add the yeah. Uh, yeah. more? Oh. Actually, it's my uh, it's forget about the the influence, uh, it, Korean influence to the you know uh, Kim Dae Gun's map. But I want to change my question because okay. it is still very um, controversial among Korean scholars and Catholics if Kim Dae-gun was cartographer or not, because Catholic, mm -hmm. uh, um, Catholics, uh, they seem not seem to, uh, they seem not to say, not to call him as a cartographer, but you know, some Korean historians want to call him a cartographer, but there is a very uh, nationalistic view uh, to judge him mm -hmm. as a cartographer or not. In, in in Korean context, because if 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 he was called as a cartographer, it means that he uh, he is a spy of France, or he was a betrayer of mm -hmm. Korea. Uh, that's why a uh, Korean Catholic did they don't do not want to call him as a cartographer, uh, and some Korean nationalistic uh, scholars want to call him as a cartographer because of that. Vice versa, but for me, um, I I am curious why you um, why you call him as a cartographer because there is not many evidence uh, to say to 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 call him uh, as a cartographer. To only um, I found some several um, several uh, documents such as. Uh, Government government uh, documents, which was uh, with, with which about uh, about about before he was executed, he was helping Korean government to translate word map in English into Korean. That was one evidence. The other one is that actually it was in the uh, book of uh, Charles Dallas. Uh, Korean uh, Catholic hi history of Korean Catholic Church, and he uh, one may maybe there is a captain of uh, Cecil uh, Vassal. Uh, he called uh, the captain called Kim Dae Gun as a cartographer, and the map. The three is only the evidence, but there is no evidence he learned. Uh, cartography or he know how to make a map so why you call him a cartographer yeah um well that's a very good question um a very good question um and uh i'm now writing an article about uh, the map of kim tae mm -hmm. um uh, so it's one of my uh main uh struggle uh, exactly what you are talking about mm -hmm. um uh, first, um, well, we know that uh, Kim Tae-gon spent almost half a year 
on uh, the uh, French vessel with um, a cartographer. Um, and well, we don't mention anything about that, but well, at that time, Kim Tegon already knew that one of his main tasks in the future would be to introduce uh, French missionaries in Korea. So basically, well, uh, probably he had some interest uh, right at the time in geography and in cartography. Um, then um, we know that in 1844, before uh, going uh, to uh, the northeast uh, border in uh, Kyongwan, uh, he mentioned in one letter that uh, uh, he had some Western maps of East Asia on, under his eyes. Um, and he seemed to be quite interested uh, by maps. And the most um, striking point is that in one of his letters dated uh, April 7, 1845, he says to um, the procurator in Macau, I send you a map of Korea. So basically, we don't know why you did it. Mm -hmm. um, did it by, did he decide by himself to write, uh, to draw a map or not? Uh, well, a uh, previous scholar, uh, beginning with uh, Choi Sok Woo, so the, uh, the tutelar figure of uh, current uh, Catholic history, said that uh, basically he wanted to do that by himself um, as a contribution, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to the understanding of uh, current geography um, for the French missionaries. Uh, I think that um, uh, Bishop Ferrell, so Vicar Apostolic, mm -hmm. requested him to draw his ma this map. Uh, it is precisely in the 1830s and 40s that the, uh, the MEP missionaries in everywhere in East Asia they start to draw maps. Mm -hmm. Before that, they did not. And it starts, at this moment, they start mm -hmm. to, to draw a map. The, the first map is a map of Vietnam in 1838. Um, so they start to draw a map because it, they start to understand 200 years after the Jesuits that they have to understand the geography of the place they are going. Uh, so you have plenty of maps of the 19th century, but it begins at that time. And one of the main struggle of French missionaries at the time is to find a safe way to enter Korea. So they have to, um, to have a good map. So I see that um, Sebastian wrote um, um, on the map issue, Western cartographer is pretty accurate by the 1830s. Uh, well, I'm not sure, or well, I have to, uh, to click on that to see what, uh, what is your the link, but uh, actually, in the 1830s, uh, my point is that it was not very accurate. I'm uh, your map is uh, the world map. Oh, yeah. So, so you have a, a world map, but well, no. Well, the, the point is that in the 1830s, mm -hmm. uh, well, we didn't. Well, the only map we had was map from the 18th century, uh, from the early 18th century. Uh, made by the Jesuits in China, uh, and was quite inaccurate. Uh, there was not even soul on the map. Mm -hmm. So, so then he did uh, uh, a more accurate map. And my point on this is that uh, Ferriol, who wanted to enter Korea with Kim Tegon in early 1845, requested him to draw a map so that we can have an idea how to enter. Um, so yeah, you have a map of yeah, Donville. So uh, the map of Donville was used until the mid 19th, the mid 19th century. And it was, um, and after the map of Kim Tegon was um, copied, it was used by many um, uh, marine officers, French, American, until the 1860s. So it came to be more accurate. Um, and um, as for the, um, uh, so that, that's why I, I would call him a, a cartographer, uh, perhaps not very good, but uh, 
I, I still would call him a cartographer. We don't know which map he used. Mm -hmm. um, the few scholars who have uh, worked on this map uh, before me have all, uh, all uh, suggested one map. Uh, so Trezago and uh, other Catholic historians suggested that was the maps of uh, Jongsangi in the 18th century. Uh, some others have suggested uh, some maps of the early 19th century. Uh, but, well, we don't have the exact map. I, I guess that he used several maps um, and uh, he blended these maps. Uh, uh, so that's my my ID. So I think we can we can call him a, a spy, uh, a cartographer. Right? That's his job. Actually, you know, in the 19th century, a lot of Catholics were spies uh, uh, and drew maps. Uh, so uh, I have no problem with uh, with that. Uh, now call him a betrayer. It's a uh, well, it's another problem. But a spy, yes. Uh, uh, a spy for missionaries, uh, I see no problem with that. Yeah. He answered to a higher power. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for your lecture tonight. Uh, the questions were very engaging. We appreciate that uh, for those of you that raise questions. Um, let's see, the next uh, event will be this Thursday uh, evening at 6 p.m. online, our colloquium. Uh, and it's part two of the topic of Korean artists in France. Uh, in two weeks time will be our next, uh, oh, let's see, no, I should do the uh, Literature Club. That's coming next on May 20th, 7.30 p.m. And uh, in two weeks time, we'll have our next lecture uh, by Dr. Thomas Duvernay. Tom has a doctorate in Korean studies. He's a professor at Yongnam University in uh, near Taegu. He teaches Korean history and English. Uh, his main historical focus has been the uh, late Chosun era of Korea with an emphasis on the 1871 uh, military action between the United States and Korea. Uh, he's been researching that for the last 25 years or so. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you then and wish I wish you all a good evening or a good afternoon or a good morning wherever you may be. Thanks again for joining us. Good night. Thanks again for everyone. Thank you. Come on. Yeah, well, we're done. I just can't get the meeting ended. <laughs> <laughs>